good evening this evening. For our new MSc in Sustainability Leadership, which will be commencing here at University of Galway this coming September 2023. My name is Orla Lenehan, and I'm the Programme Director for the MSc in Sustainability Leadership. So I'll kick off the information evening by giving you a brief overview of the programme. Uh, you'll then hear from our sustainability officer here at the University of Galway, who will highlight the university's progress to date in the area of sustainability. I will then introduce Barry Gavin, the Sustainability Independent Non-Executive Director, who will discuss the importance and need for upskilling in this area. Now, if you have any questions at any stage during the talks, please feel free to pop the questions into the chat function and one of my team members will endeavour to answer the query as we're going through the talks, or indeed afterwards, if we haven't been able to answer the question, we will give time at the end to answer any questions that are left unanswered. Uh, just a reminder to let you know that this session is being recorded, and if anyone wants access to the recording afterwards to go back on any information, please feel free to contact us and we can send you the recording. I might also just give a quick word of warning that unfortunately due to the weather this evening with the thunder and lightning, our connection is a little bit intermittent and coming and going. But one of my team members will let me know if the connection is unstable and I will make sure to repeat any of the information in case you have missed anything. So without further ado, I'll kick off and introduce the programme. So one of the key objectives of this new MSc in sustainability leadership is to directly address the identified gap in sustainability leadership skills. So as many of you may already be aware yourselves from your own roles and your own experience, most organizations, large or small, are grappling with managing the transition towards a sustainable planet and society. For example, SkillNet Ireland's recent report on talent for Ireland's green economy concludes that Leadership is essential to encourage employees to engage with climate action and sustainability issues. Yet, such skills are currently in low supply, but high demand. So this MSc in sustainability leadership will enable participants to formulate strategies to effectively drive sustainable business transformation. Now, how do we do this? Well, we achieve this by offering a wide interdisciplinary curriculum on the programme. And the curriculum draws on expertise from many disciplines, including the traditional business disciplines like management, economics, finance, but also drawing on expertise from our colleagues right across the university, including colleagues in science, social science and engineering. And what this does is it allows participants to develop a multi-perspective an innovative approach to designing sustainable solutions and sustainable business models. So just to give you a sense as to some of the types of modules and content that are on the programme, the first year of the programme will provide a foundation to core management and sustainability concepts. So concepts such as life cycle thinking, circular economy, sustainable supply chain management, business ethics and organizational culture. Now, the majority of these lectures and classes will be held online, but at the end of the first year, students will undertake two immersive learning in-person blocks. And each of these in-person blocks will comprise three days. So on the first of these blocks, students will undertake an international study visit to our partner in Bologna, Bologna Business School. And the second of these in-person blocks will involve a number of field trips around the West of Ireland region. Now, in each of these immersive learning experiences, students will undertake a number of company site visits to experience firsthand how companies are transitioning towards a sustainable planet and society. There will be guest talks from industry thought leaders who will share their insights on sustainability transition strategies and actions. And there will be a number of networking events and collaborative opportunities. And this will allow students to build a varied and global network of contacts with shared values and a sustainable mindset. In the second year of the course, students will have the option of selecting a number of elective modules. 
And this will allow students to focus more narrowly on particular areas and skill sets that they wish to develop further. So perhaps in areas such as green finance, systems thinking, stakeholder engagement, etc. So I won't go into too much more detail in this information evening on the detailed curriculum, but I would encourage you to explore the program website and have a browse through the detailed module descriptions that are available on the program website. And this will give you a sense as to the content and the types of assessments that are included on the program. So I believe that one of my team members will now put in the web link to the program website into the chat function. And you should be able to see that link to the program web page in the chat function. And you can copy that link yourself and have a look through your browser and have a look at all of the modules on the program. Finally, then maybe to just give you some information on the delivery approach for the program. So we're very keen to ensure that the program delivery is as flexible as possible and responsive to industry's emerging skills needs. So there will be one in-person block at the commencement of the programme, and this will take place here on campus in the University of Galway. Now, this is really important to provide students with the opportunity for open debate, conversation, relationship building, peer-to-peer -peer exchanges, and collaborating with your classmates and your colleagues. The remainder of the classes then for the first year will be delivered online through a variety of approaches, including lectures, interactive discussions, breakout rooms, group work, presentations, podcasts, etc. Now, we're actually very fortunate to be quite skilled in all of these online learning tools and technologies at this stage as a result of the pandemic a few years ago. So we're very confident that students will receive a very engaging and rich educational experience from these online sessions. The live online classes will be supplemented with additional material for students and supplemented with podcasts and pre-recorded lectures. And this will allow students to work around their own timetables, their working, family and other commitments. They will be able to engage in this material in an asynchronous manner and then come back into the live online sessions and collaborate with their students again. Um, we will ensure to make all live online sessions recorded. So for anyone that is registered on the program, they will be able to access these sessions. They will be recorded. There is an understanding that everyone has lots of commitments. And while we would encourage people to please partake as much as you can in the live online sessions, we do, of course, recognize that everyone has a number of other commitments and it's not always possible to attend online at the scheduled time. Finally, some very brief other information points. The entry requirements for the program are that applicants must have a minimum of two years post-graduation experience, along with a primary degree in any of the key undergraduate disciplines, such as business, science, social science, engineering, or any other discipline, as long as you have an undergraduate degree. The university is offering a number of scholarships to cover up to 50% of the tuition fees on the program. And there will be further information on these scholarships available on the program website. I would encourage you to keep checking back on the program website over the next week or two, because we will be launching a number of additional scholarships in addition to what has already been announced on the program website. So do please check back for further information on scholarships that may suit your own individual circumstances. Finally, if you have any other queries after the event, if anything else comes to mind, please don't hesitate to contact our excellent program administrator, Sandra Brennan. So Sandra is always super efficient at responding to your queries and always delighted to help anyone with a query on the program. So what we might do is get one of our team members to pop Sandra's email address into the chat function. And you'll have Sandra's email address available and you can copy that and keep it in your contacts. If you have any queries afterwards, please feel free to reach out to Sandra. So thank you very much for listening to the first section of our information evening, which provides you with a brief overview of the programme. I'd now like to introduce our sustainability officer here in the University of Galway, Michelle O'Dowd-Lohan.
So Michelle is the former Environmental and Waste Management Coordinator with the Health Service Executive. She was appointed as the inaugural Sustainability Officer at University of Galway in September 2019. And she now plays a senior role in supporting the university to achieve its sustainability targets and goals. So thank you so much, Michelle, for joining us this evening. And I'm sure the participants are looking forward to hearing the progress that we've made to date. But I know in particular myself, I'm very much looking forward to hearing it. So over to you, Michelle. Thanks very much, Orla, and no pressure there at all. <laughs> um, so good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Michelle odowd Lohan, and I am the Sustainability Officer at the University of Galway. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here this evening, taking part in this information evening on our new Sustainability Leadership Programme. Um, I suppose as University of Galway's inaugural Sustainability Officer, I'm a real advocate and promoter of sustainability leadership within organisations. You know, sustainability leadership really is an imperative in today's world, regardless of the sector that you're in. And if I give the example of our own sector here, the university sector, you know, sustainability leadership is absolutely key for us. And just by way of example, you know, through our teaching and learning, we can equip students with knowledge and skills to become sustainability role models and leaders. And um, if we have sustainability leadership in our research, we can help solve some of the most challenging sustainability issues, you know, around energy security, food security, protecting endangered species. So that leadership piece really allows us to extend sustainability beyond the campus walls and into our local communities. But as well as there being really positive social and environmental benefits for us by engaging in sustainability leadership within the university sector, it also makes really good business sense. You know, for example, we know that more and more prospective students are around the world are taking a university's commitment to sustainability into consideration when they're making their choices. Uh, we know that we have the potential to open up new funding streams when we engage in research that is seeking to address sustainability challenges. And we all know from an operational perspective, if we show leadership in this area around, you know, energy and food and water and waste, that's all makes really good business sense. So in my view, regardless of the sector you're in, sustainability leadership is absolutely key. And if you think about it in any sector, be it, you know, agriculture, transportation, construction, tourism, food, fashion, any of these areas, sustainability leadership is really important. So on that note, I just wanted to move on and say to you that if you do decide to take the course here at the University of Galway, I do believe that you're taking the course in a university that is committed to sustainability. You know, sustainability is one of our four core values and it is a key pillar of our strategic plan. And I suppose normally in organisations, when you're developing a strategy, you decide what your vision is and you build your strategy around that. But what we actually decided to do was decide as a campus community, well, what are our values? And we then built our strategy around our values. So through a series of campus wide consultations, a number of core values emerged. And the values that ended up as our core values include sustainability, respect, excellence and openness. And sustainability now is a key pillar of our strategic plan with 10 flagship actions across the university mission. But in terms of leadership, I just really want to point out that in any organization, while you need leadership at the highest level, you also need that bottom up approach, the student voice, the action, the activism, because sustainability ended up as a core value for us because of the very strong student voice. Students voted overwhelmingly for sustainability as a core value. So in an organization, there is an onus there to build within that organization, a, you know, a real awareness and understanding of the importance of sustainability. Um, I just wanted to say as well, the day that we launched our strategic plan for the university, our university president also signed the STG Accord. And what that means is that we have committed publicly to align all our major efforts to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, Targets and Indicators, including through our education and research, our operations, our planning, our engagement activities. So I'm not sure um, participants on the webinar this evening how familiar you are with the SDGs, but I just wanted to take two minutes to just highlight the SDGs and just to let you know that these really are the international language for sustainability in the world today. And these goals, my understanding, Orla, are covered quite extensively in the master's programme. They're absolutely key. So what are they? So back in September 2015, 193 world leaders, the United Nations General Assembly, 
including our Taoiseach at the time, Enda Kenny, agreed the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. But at the very core or heart of that agenda are the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, 17 goals that have been dubbed as the 2030 Agenda for Transforming the World. And, you know, they really are a transformation. And this probably is one of the most important, most significant global agreements in, in our recent past. So, so it's really important that we get a very good oversight of these goals. And really what the SDGs allow us as an institution to do is to move past that understanding of sustainability as being solely about environmental sustainability, more like they're a roadmap towards environmental sustainability, economic prosperity, social inclusion. You know, I said sustainability is a leadership imperative in today's world because organizations are facing increasing pressures to respond to complex global problems such as climate change, labor exploitation, you know, persistent inequality, but the SDGs allow us to address and look at all these areas. And that's why they will be covered so extensively in this course. Um, just moving on, um, I've talked a lot about leadership and institutional commitment, but how are we embedding sustainability into our campus or how are we trying to make our campus more sustainable? So the model we use at the University of Galway, we call it a learn, live, lead model. So really our approach is based on embedding sustainability into all aspects of our teaching and learning. So everyone that comes to campus at University of Galway, they learn about sustainability. But then aligned to that, we're trying to set the campus up that we live more sustainably in everything that we do. You know, the food that we eat, the energy we use, how we manage our waste, how we promote health and well-being. And I suppose the idea is if we're learning it and we're living it, that should position us then to be role models and leaders in terms of translating that sustainability agenda beyond the campus walls and into our local communities. So it's a learn, live, lead approach that we're using. Now, I understand I'm doing a session as part of this Sustainability Leadership Masters, and in that session, I will go through in detail the work package areas that are behind this Will Learn Live Lead model, the strategy that we have in place, the KPIs, how we measure progress, our reporting, etc. But suffice to say for the introductory evening here this evening, that it's this Learn Live Lead approach that we're using. So as I come to the end of my short talk, so this question is, you know, you're talking a lot about leadership and commitment and that kind of thing. Well, how are you doing as a university in terms of sustainability? Are you doing good? Are things going well? So I just wanted to share a few slides, which is just to show our progress in the area. So I suppose the first thing I would say is that University of Galway, we're a non tashka Green Campus Ireland awarded site, acknowledging many years of hard work, promoting sustainability across five key areas, energy, water, waste, transport and biodiversity and I suppose we were awarded the green flag initially in 2018 but it's a program of continuing improvement so we were reassessed again in 2022 and we've been awarded the green flag again so so we're very happy about that the next I suppose achievement I just wanted to share with you is that we are a national SDG champion for Ireland now this has just emerged in the last couple of months and we're still absolutely delighted about it but I did talk about the SDGs and they were agreed Back in 2015, um, you know, our government was represented by Enda Kenny at the time. But what this SDG programme is trying to do is to take the SDGs from that government context and bring it into a more societal context where everyone in society has a role to play in terms of advancing the SDGs. And as part of all of this, the government of Ireland developed this SDG Champions programme. So it originated initially in 2019, but because of COVID, it was paused. So it emerged again at the end of 2022, where um, DEC looked for SDG champions for the year 23-24. We put in our application and we're delighted to say that we're the first university in Ireland to be recognised as a national SDG champion. And we have a whole framework of work planned for the year to really promote the champion status and promote the SDGs and the progress we as the university are making in this area. Um, I suppose, again, continuing on that theme of the SDGs, there are a number of ranking systems uh, where we rank university performance, but one of those ranking systems is the Times Higher Education Impact Rankings. And these measure universities' progress and actually progressing the SDGs. And progress is measured across four metric areas, teaching, research, operations, and stewardship. So um, in the latest version of the rankings, the 2023 rankings, we're delighted to say that we're now ranked 34th in the world out of 1,600 institutions. 
We're the number one university in Ireland and we're ranked fifth in the world for sustainable consumption and production. So we're really delighted with the progress there. And, and our final achievement of, of late is that we're a STARS Sustainability Tracking Assessment and Rating System Gold Rated Institution by ASHI, the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education. So we were awarded that in 2021. So it's been a long journey. You know, we started our sustainability journey in earnest in 2015, but just over the last couple of years, we, we've had success in the area. But just to say that we very much view sustainability as a journey rather than an endpoint in itself. You know, obviously the climate doesn't understand rankings, doesn't understand goal ratings, you know, so we have a whole programme of work planned for the coming years that set out in our climate action roadmap to address all these areas. So a lot of work in areas like procurement, like travel, um, a lot of work around biodiversity on the campus. So a lot of plans for the year ahead. And we definitely don't think it's the end of the road, um, but we are, you know, proud of the campus effort, which is a university-wide holistic approach to sustainability in terms of getting us where we are today. So um, I suppose as I come to the end, I just want to say that if you want to find out more about sustainability at the University of Galway, we do have a website there. We're also on Twitter and on Instagram. And maybe just if I can conclude myself and say that certainly in our organization, there is a move towards sustainability leadership you know, within organizations. So with the university sector, very much a move towards developing sustainability offices. So my role as the sustainability officer is the only role in the university at the moment. We have now funding in place to put in place a sustainability office, and there'll be some senior leadership roles within that office. For example, a carbon accountant, a climate officer, a director of sustainability. And that certainly has been the move within the university sector here in Ireland. And the other thing I would say is that through the Climate Action Plan, there's a public sector mandate, and that specifically requires institutions to identify sustainability and climate action champions, so a named leader in the area, and to adequately resource the area through the provision of green teams, etc. So certainly from my vantage point, um, there is a, a move towards sustainability leadership in this area. So Shinamates, um, that's all I have to say this evening. And thank you very much, Orla and Luigi, for inviting me along. Fantastic, Michelle. Thank you very, very much for a very rich, um, engaging and interesting presentation. And I suppose just to say personally myself, we're all so excited about the journey we're on. And I think you're spot on. We don't see this as the end and, and it's a continuing journey all the time. And I hope that the participants get the sense that in our university, we very, very much all work together. Academics, sustainability officers, researchers, teachers, we're all on the same page on this and very, very passionate about the sustainability agenda. So I hope that you can see some of that from, from Michelle's presentation. And of course, we're delighted with the latest rankings to be number one in Ireland for sustainable development. So well done, Michelle, to your team for the fantastic work. And I hope you continue to do that fantastic work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to turn to our industry guest speaker tonight. So I'd like to welcome Mr. Barry Gavin. Barry is a sustainability independent non-executive director. Barry has over 20 years experience in sustainable finance and development as a C-suite executive and non-executive board member. Barry currently holds a number of independent non-executive board positions, and he's also an adjunct lecturer in both the University of Galway and University College Dublin. So Barry, thank you very much for joining us this evening. I know from working with you many times over the last few years that you're an extremely busy professional. So we're very privileged to have your industry insights this evening for a half an hour. Yeah, delighted so, to join you. Um, thank you very much. Maybe you might just start with giving us just a little bit of a brief background to yourself and your experience and your insights in this space, please. Yeah, so as you said, my my, my background is, is sustainable finance. I've, I've been operating in the area of climate change for the last 20 years. As you mentioned, um, I, I operate today as an independent uh, director with a number of both semi-state and private companies. So I'm on the board of OnPost. Um, I chair a joint venture between Cruelty and ESB called Future Energy Ireland. I'm also on the board of the City of Dublin Energy Management Agency that works with the four local authorities to decarbonise Dublin. They also sit on an international infrastructure fund, um, as well as, as you said, um, lecturing in, in both um, UCD Smurfit and the University of Galway. So I suppose what, what, I, what I 
what I bring to the lecture side is, is my 20 odd years of experience and, and that lecturing also dovetails quite nicely with, with, with my day job. So yeah, sustainability and, and particularly in the area of finances is, is something I've been working on for the last 20 years, yeah. Well, lovely, and I mean, I think to have worked on it for the last 20 years, you probably have something of a first mover advantage because, you know, certainly in the last four to five years, sustainability, particularly in the finance, the accounting, the reporting space has just become such a hot topic. Um, and I think it's great to have had that previous experience that you can now bring. I yeah. suppose based on, on your experience, um, can I ask you, it, well, it's one question, but I'll kind of split it into two. I suppose, firstly, what are your concerns about the risks that sustainability presents at the moment for organizations? And maybe secondly, coupled with that, what are maybe hopefully your, your you know, what do you think are the opportunities that might arise out of sustainability? So what are the risks? And then maybe what are the opportunities for organizations as a result of the sustainability agenda that we're now living in? Yeah. Um... It's it's very it's very topical that you, you should you should ask that question, Orla, because it's something that companies are now having to face um, head on if they haven't been looking at, at this issue up to now. I suppose if we just go back to first principles and and you know what is sustainability and, and I like to think of it in the context of the three P's, which is the planet, people, and profit. And I think you know what often gets lost in the context of sustainability is the importance of profit because companies won't survive unless they're economically viable and therefore profitable. So anything that we discuss in the context of sustainability can be seen through the lens of profitability. And to your point, um, there's two sides to that coin. There's the risk side, so the threats, and there's no doubt when you talk about sustainability and particularly things like climate change, they are financial risks, You know whether that's to your income side, your expenditure, uh, or to your balance sheet or cash flow, they are fundamental risks to, to your business. And those risks, you know, they tend to talk about them under under two headings. One is the physical risk. So, um, you know, the, we're seeing it all the time, the natural catastrophes that are taking place, whether that's drought or wildfire, you know, um, extreme weather events and how that's going to impact on the business. And then I suppose more sublimin subliminally are the transition risks. So as we transition to um, a net zero economy, which is a fundamental change and something we have to go through, I mean, you know, the scary part for me is we talk about net zero by 2050. I think the science now tells us we don't have until 2050 to get to net zero. We need to get there an awful lot quicker. And there's even data coming out this week um, in relation to, in some cases, we've actually breached 1.5 already. So that's a fairly uh, scary scenario for both, not only for organizations, but for, for the, the, the wider global population. But the transition risk, so as we transition to this new, um, to this, uh, new uh, economy, you know, you have, you have policy and legal risk coming through. So, I mean, we're starting to see that already through regulation, particularly from the EU, but we're seeing it in the UK, we're seeing it in the US with the SEC, we're seeing it internationally, but there's more regulation, both on the reporting side, but also in terms of standards. I mean, if you look at the automotive industry, my own view is, you know, we wouldn't have seen such a rapid transition to electric vehicles if governments hadn't set very specific policies and targets about decarbonisation of transportation. And some companies have been late to the party that some of them have been left behind. So that's an example of a transition transition risk that 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 um that can impact on on, uh, on on companies. Also reputationally, and we hear this word about greenwashing, where companies um who are very conscious of their reputation, rightly so, who maybe not. Are, are, are wholly truthful with what they're doing. I mean, the very famous one would be the Volkswagen scandal, again, if we keep focus on the automotive industry, where they overstated the, the, um, the emissions or, or understated the emissions of their, of their uh, vehicles. But there are lots of other examples that that would, would lead to. So, I mean, that's the, the, they're sort of the risks there. So we, we broadly look at them under both physical and, and transitional. But I think the clever companies, the, the ones that have actually identified this as an opportunity have moved an awful lot quicker and there are real opportunities. I think McKinsey estimate, you know, that if we're to reach a net zero economy, we need to invest in the region of $9 trillion every year between now and 2050. So that's 120 trillion that needs to be invested in this space right across the, the, the whole um, the whole economy if we're, to, if, to, if we're to try and stay below two degrees. And, and that's a huge opportunity for business. And you know, a, a space that I would know very well, which is the energy space, is going through an absolutely rapid transition. And there are businesses evolving today that didn't exist two or three years ago, and services and products that didn't um, it, uh, exist a couple of years ago. So there's a huge opportunity um, for companies. But even in the short term, you know, companies that are looking to reduce their energy footprint, they're seeing real savings through energy efficiency. I mean, they talk about energy efficiency contributing up to 25% 
of the savings that are required to reach net zero. So if a company just go, does an energy audit and looks at where it's wasting energy, does, it can go straight to the bottom line in real terms very, 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 very quickly. Um, and then, of course, there's, there's new products and services, there's new markets. Um, and, and customers are getting um, are, are getting a lot more sophisticated, and that's both a threat and an opportunity. So, if you're in a, a B2B environment, um, particularly with the reporting regulations, um, where companies are measuring their scope one, two, and three emissions. So, as a supplier to a company, you're going to form part of their scope three emissions. They're going to be forcing you to start measuring and reporting on it. So, there's going to be an absolute obligation there. And if I go back to my um, on post uh, experience, on post a number of years ago, made a strategic decision. I think you would use the word strategy earlier on. Um, the, com the smart companies see this as strategic, um, climate change and sustainability challenges as strategic. Um, they took a strategic decision to, um, to, to decarbonize what they call the last mile in the city. So in other words, the, the postmen and women as they delivered that they were going to electrify their vehicles. But they did it purely from a sustainability point of view because they wanted to address their scope one emissions. What they've actually found is, and in the business of Unpost, um, the challenge for them is that post uh, letters internationally are falling probably by an average of about 5% a year. And to, to fill that gap, they've transitioned into what we call e-commerce or, or parcels. And they support the likes of Amazon, Marks & Spencer, Dunn Stores, Nike, lots of international companies, Boohoo, uh, servicing the Irish market. And what they found is the fact that they have electrified their last mile, in other words, um, decarbonized it, is now becoming a, a selling point, a point of differentiation for them when they're dealing with their customers, because again, this feeds into their customer scope three emissions. So what started off as a strategy from a sustainability perspective has actually become a business strategy. And I think that's that's the key part. And I think what, what's important about this course is it looks at it from a strategic perspective. You can look at it through the what I call the operational lens in terms of having to measure and report, which all companies will have to do eventually, the bigger companies under the, the CSRD requirement from the EU are going to have to start doing it from 2025. The people think, well, I'm not a big company, therefore it's not going to impact me, but it actually will. If you're a supplier to a large company, you're going to be obliged to do the same type of measurement. So that's what I call the operational piece. So if you just look at it at, from the lens of, well, what do I have to report? What are my obligations? I think that's a very narrow focus and you're going to be left behind. I think that smart companies are actually looking at this strategically. They're saying, let's recognize what the risks are, but a risk is both a threat and an opportunity. So recognize the threats and try and mitigate them and manage them as best you can. But more importantly, where's the opportunity going to, going to arise? And what we're seeing is that in every market, there are huge opportunities that haven't existed in the past. And as I said, it's the clever companies, the smart companies that are looking at this um, through the strategic lens. And I think when you start to look at strategy, um, you know, people, you know, people talk to me about, well, I'm in sales or in marketing or I'm in engineering or I'm in legal. This doesn't really have anything to do with me. The reality is it does because every aspect of a business is going to be impacted because it's about the strategy of the company. Where are we going into the future? What's the strategy going to look like? And therefore, it's going to impact on every part of the business. So at the moment, it's probably touching the finance people at the front end because they're having to do the reporting piece. But that's even going to transition down, down uh, very deeply in, into the organization. So this is, um, it's, probably, it's probably the single biggest challenge facing organizations today. And I said the clever ones have actually got out ahead of it and are looking at it from a strategic point of view. But there's a huge market opportunity. I've just stopped, spoken about energy and the amount that has to be spent on that. But you go into lots of different sectors, you know, there's going to be the same opportunities. For the, some people talk about a cost, but I look at it as an investment opportunity. So, I mean, and I think that's the way companies have to look at it, Orla. Yeah, I love that, Barry, and I'm fully on the same page with you on that. I mean, your last point there, looking at it as a cost, I think organizations that fail to integrate sustainability into their overall organizational strategy are really missing a trick on this yeah. one, um, because this this is a, is a strategic issue. And I mean, I'm always a, an optimist. I know there are a lot. I, I'm an accountant by trade, so it's unusual to have an optimistic accountant. I know that. But mm -hmm. um, I believe that if you just focus on the, the accounting information and the reports and the data that needs to be you know, reported on. You're jumping to the end without actually starting at the beginning of this journey. The, you know, the data and the measurements and the KPIs and all of that is actually the end, and that should be the end result. And what you need to do in order to get there is to stand back and look at this from the overall organization's point of view. So I, I, I really am I'm on the same page with you on that. And I think it's important for people to actually approach sustainability 
in that manner because, you know, you did point out that there's just so much, there's bucket loads of regulations and requirements now um, that you can get consumed in the data. So it's important to stand back and, and, and look at it from that overall strategic point of view. I suppose maybe to just kind of link it back to why we're here and, and, yep. and for the benefit of the participants listening tonight, I suppose, what in your own opinion are the are the real tangible benefits for people that are listening here tonight? What would be the real tangible benefits of signing up to a program like the MSc in sustainability leadership and upskilling in this area? Yeah, so um, what I'm seeing in the business community is if, if you were to do a stakeholder mapping, so in other words, look at all the all the stakeholders that, that you're touching on a day to day basis over. That's everything from, you know, you might be in a regulated industry directly or indirectly, your banks, your investors, your customers, whether you're B2B or B2C, the communities that you're working with, your suppliers, your board, and most importantly, your employees. So all of these stakeholders now have a real agenda around um, sustainability. So for example, if you look at the banks, what we're seeing now with loan applications is that um, there's now a, an ever increasing uh, section on sustainability and people are sort of saying, well, why is that? Because the reality is, you know, banks, when we talk about for example, climate change, we talk about emissions. We talk about them in the context of scope one, two, and three. So, so scope one are your direct emissions, scope two is from the energy you consume, and scope three is your supply chain upstream and downstream. So for someone like a bank, the majority of their emissions are in scope three. So they're the customers who use their product, which is money. So therefore, they have to start understanding what, what their customer's footprint is like. And they're starting not only they're now in the data capture piece, but you're going to see more and more products coming in and pricing reflecting um, the green credentials of borrowing. Um, we're already seeing, for example, in the mortgage area, you've, you've green mortgages, so they're, they're more attractive and they're, they're better priced. And we're seeing the same in the finance market. So also investors, you know, investors are, are very focused now on uh, impact investing and investing in sustainable uh, activities. And, and there's a huge wall of money coming into that space. As I mentioned earlier on, customers, um, we're seeing it in procurement. You know, uh, if you want to be a supplier to a company now, part of the procurement process and, and in terms of the ranking is your sustainability credentials how sustainable is the product that you provide and it's getting a higher and higher uh, weighting in terms of the, the procurement uh, piece on an annual basis if you're in the b2c we're seeing that consumers are getting more conscious of sustainability credentials of of the products that they're buying the services and i suppose the real one that, that we're seeing today is about employees um, and particularly the the, the the current generation of employees are very focused on the sustainable agenda and climate change and what the research is telling us is that if you want to attract the best and retain the best, then you have to be, you have to walk the talk when it comes to sustainability. Um, and obviously boards as well from a governance perspective are, perspective are interested in it. So every stakeholder that you touch is going to be looking at you through the lens of sustainability. And as I said, the smart companies are getting out ahead of that. And they're recognizing where the threats are, but they're also recognizing what the opportunities are. And if you can build a sustainable business, when I talk about sustainable, it's not only through the, the, the lens of environmental and social, but it's also through the lens of profitability. As I said, what we're seeing is that the smart companies, um, and, and, and another example of one is, is one that's investing in Ireland, like Orsted. Orsted were one of the largest, they're a Danish company. They were, they were creating a lot of energy from, from coal. They actually transitioned out of that business about 10 years ago. They sold off all of their coal plants and they transitioned into offshore uh, wind. And they're now the largest offshore wind company in the world. Um, and that's just another example of a company that looked at this through the space strategically. Um, they, they, they ditched the old business model for the new. And that can be very challenging for, for companies. And that's why we're seeing a lot of disruptors coming into the market because they don't have a legacy business model that they're starting to, that they're trying to hang on to. And I think that's the, probably the single biggest challenge that companies are, are facing. So am I going to transition from a legacy business model that could be profitable, that could be cash generated, and actually transition into something new? And that, that's, a, that's a mindset change. Um, and that's probably the single biggest challenge that I see facing companies. And how do we have the, the bravery and the vulnerability to move away? Um, and, and I think that's why you need to have all your team on board. And I think having sustainability leaders within the group throughout, you know, at all sections in the organization are really, really going to be key to this because it's simple to describe, but it's not easy to implement. And therefore, you know, we need we need a lot of bravery and we need, um, you know, some, uh, some, some strategic thinking in this space. 
Yeah, no, you're spot on. And I mean, you mentioned something there. It's one of my favorite phrases. This is really one of the areas where you need to be a disruptive innovator. And it's quite welcome if you're disruptive yeah. um, because you need to push the boundaries and you need to be brave. And, and I, I think, you know, you, you mentioned there that you've mentioned several different examples of different industries. And obviously you're, you're, you've so much experience across many, many ranges of sectors. And the reality is, and Michelle mentioned the same point, you know, sometimes people say to me, well, I'm in a particular industry and you know sustainability doesn't really impact us it's affecting every walk of life every organization every industry in some shape or form um and and really you know there's no shortage of a need for leadership in this space look barry i, I don't want to take up any more of your time i might just mention to participants that barry delivers a wonderful summer school on our program which will be made available to this new msc in sustainability leadership so we're only delighted that we can avail of barry's expertise in in that summer school so anyone that is interested interested in signing up for the program you'll hear lots more from Barry Gavin next year on the program but Barry thank you very much for your insights and we really appreciate it thanks thank you that. thanks Barry so that will conclude uh, all of the talks on the information evening this evening. Um, I hope you found them some bit informative. Um, I hope it has given you a sense as to the type of program that we're really ambitiously trying to offer here. Um, we're really trying to move the dial on this, but we're also really trying to respond to industry's needs um, and, and organizations' needs in this space. Um, I know that there are one or two questions in the Q&A, so I will maybe touch on addressing them now. Um, and if anyone else has any other questions in the meantime, while I'm looking through these questions, please type something into the chat function. In the meantime, if you don't have any other questions, um, thank you very much for staying until the end. And I'm delighted that everybody has stayed around and listened to our talks. I hope you found them informative. Um, I would very much hope to see many of you join us on this exciting journey that we are on. Um, and do please reach out to us if any questions come to mind afterwards. Um, so just to address some of the questions that have popped into the chat, um, will blockchain design thinking be a part of the program? So uh, thank you very much for your question. And I saw this pop up uh, when I was uh, doing my talk and I had to try and scramble uh, to some of the course outlines on the program. Um, now, we do have design thinking as part of one of the modules on the program, which is called sustainable information systems. Um, the, pro the module is not running until the second year of the program. So the uh, final module module outline does have to be finalized before the second year. And so what I will do is reach out to the lecturer who delivers that module and specifically ask them if they will be actually covering blockchain within that content. And we will get back to you uh, on, on that query, Andrew. Um, you've also asked us how is communication taught on the program? So by that, I assume, but please, you know, come back and and, and type in if, if I've got this wrong. But I assume you mean, I suppose, the ability uh, to communicate a sustainability strategy across your organization, maybe to embed that into the culture of the organization. And in particular, often maybe the challenge with sustainability is, um, you know, often to try and encourage your own employees um, to take more sustainable actions. And if you like to secure that buy-in from your employees and, and your customers and whatnot. So if, if that is, is what your question is speaking to, well, we would very much cover communication really in, in most of our modules. Um, but where you will really see that skill set come to life is particularly in the very first semester, we start with a very core foundational management and leadership module called responsible management and leadership. And that speaks particularly to communication and, and strategy and, and, and things like that. But at the end of the first year, I mentioned in the um, program overview that students will undertake a number of field trips. And they will hear from a number of industry thought leaders on various aspects, like how to communicate their strategy and, and communicating that strategy specifically to their employees across the organization. And actually your assessments and your assignments that will be based on those field trips. You know, we won't be just uh, going to Bologna and having a good time for three days. Unfortunately, I'm sure we'll have a good time, but unfortunately there will be assignments attached to that part of the program. And what you will have to do after afterwards is reflect on the learning that you achieved during that field trip. And in particular, you will be going out to a number of companies and undertaking site visits where you will actually learn 
particularly how these organizations are communicating their strategy. I, I happened to just actually visit Boston Scientific last week here in the local Galway region, and they are a, a exemplary at communicating their strategy. And so it's those types of organizations that we will be taking you out to, to get a sense as to how you can achieve that skill set. Um, in terms of the time commitment, so we have a query here asking on the time commitment required to be put in on a weekly basis. Well, I suppose that question, um, always uh, I would say that every every student and every participant, uh, you know, would, would have a different answer for that question. The reason why is because everyone is bringing their own skill sets, their own experience, their own knowledge to the programme. It will very much depend on your own aptitude for learning, um, everyone learns in a different way and everyone approaches modules and assignments in a different way. But I suppose in particular, in terms of the contact hours, um, on a weekly basis, there will be lectures two evenings a week. So live online lectures from approximately half six to eight o'clock on a Tuesday and a Thursday evening. So in the very least, you would be expected to either attend those lectures live if you can make it live or at least engage with the recording afterwards. But there will be, I would expect, approximately at least in the very least three to four additional hours every week on top of that, where you will be expected to maybe engage in some pre-reading. There will be obviously assignments throughout the semester. Thankfully, there are no end of semester exams and, and people always like to hear that information. But it is quite an intense course in that this is a level nine master's and it's really speaking to um, the leadership skills that are required in organizations. So there is an expectation on participants when they sign up for this program that they're willing and interested to engage in, in the program and in the material. And I, I very much expect that to be the case with the participants that take the course. You know, usually these types of students are very hardworking, very diligent and, and really are signing up to, to progress their career and advance their career. Um, how many participants do you expect to be on the course? Well, you know, this is we don't have a crystal ball, unfortunately, for that one. Um, I will tell you that we will intend on capping the numbers at 35. Um, and the reason why we will do that is we really want this to be a quality offering MSC. Um, it's very important to have a class size that allows participants to develop relationships with their classmates and their colleagues and to form those collaborations and to have meaningful group work. Um, so, you know, you certainly won't be sitting in a classroom with 100 other students. This is a very hands on, um, you know, intense program that will allow you to develop relationships and collaborations with your classmates and your peers. Um, is the course covered under Springboard? I will uh, get one of my team members to come back to you on that question, Elva. Um, I, I, to my knowledge, it's not covered under Springboard, but I will certainly ensure that one of our team members comes back to you on that to confirm. Are the costs of the field trips in addition to the yearly fees? No, they're not, Michael. Um, and I did see um, uh, somebody was was also questioning about the fees. Um, and and uh, I would say to students that the real benefit of this program is that we, there's a real acknowledgement that sustainability is not just something that affects us here in Galway, here in Ireland, here in Dublin, or you know even in Europe. This is something that affects us all over the world. Um, and what we were really keen to do was to give students an opportunity for an international trip to experience how organisations in another region Region are grappling um, with this transition to a sustainable planet and society. And that was the logic and the reasoning behind including an international field trip. But as a result of that, we've included the costs of those field trips into the, uh, into the fees. So the field trip expenses are all covered within the, uh, the program fees. Um, I think that that is all of the questions for now. Um, thank you very much for your word of thanks. And we're certainly looking forward to you starting the course as well. Um, and if I will, we will uh, intend to stay on for a few minutes and answer any more questions. Can you clarify the postgrad experience? Yes. So what we mean by that, Emily, is that we are not accepting applicants that are coming directly from an undergraduate degree. 
The reason why that is the case is that this is, if you like, a type of executive education type postgraduate program. It's really important for participants to have that little bit of professional working experience subsequent to their undergraduate degree, because that type of work experience really brings a rich educational background and professional experience into the classroom. And what we really want to achieve with this program is that participants will be actually able to learn from each other other as much as learning from us we hope that you can learn from us but it's also very important to learn from each other and learn from your classmates so we really value that that postgraduate working experience so what we're looking for is people who have had a little bit of, of work experience after their undergraduate degree so i hope that clarifies that for you <coughs> thank you noel thank you Thank you, Andrew. So what industry exposure our applicants can be expected to get? So I'm I'm assuming by that question that what you mean is maybe what types of uh, of industry guest speakers will we have maybe and what types of company site visits will we be undertaking um so while we don't have those schedules finalized yet um i have a sense already of some of the companies that we will be visiting here and, and in the bologna region you know we're really keen to try and give you as wide an exposure as possible to different industries so we might be looking at large manufacturing small manufacturing but also maybe pharmaceutical i mean you know the italian region has some really interesting um, types of companies over there, like the car, car manufacturing industry, the food industry, the wine industry. Um, we have already made a visit to the wind farm, the wind park in the um, in the Uchterard region of Galway. Um, and in terms of our industry guest speakers, we will also then, I suppose, any companies that we don't actually get a chance to go out and visit, we'll try and get some uh, experts in from other industries, uh, in particular, the likes of Barry Gavin's area in terms of finance, reporting. We'll have some experts in from maybe the, the accountancy practices to speak to you about the, the reporting and, and the finance side of things. So, you know, really hoping, I, I think, to, to make those experiences as varied and as rich as, as possible. So I hope that gives you um, a sense as to, to, to the activities. Uh, so thank you, Andrew. So responsible management and leadership is, yes, correct, a microcred course. Um, and this microcred is for 10 credits, 10 ECTS. Um, so in terms of the program outline, um, in the very first semester, there are two modules on the program, Consumption and Society, which is five credits, and that Responsible Management and Leadership course, which is 10 credits. So if you take that as a microcred um, on its own initially and, and then decide that you want to pursue the full MSc afterwards, you will have those 10 credits already secured. So the entire program, so a level nine master's is 90 credits. So that will uh, that will get you 10 credits out of the program. OK, so we'll just stay on for a few more minutes if anyone has any other queries that they would like addressed. Um, but, you know, please, please feel free to reach out afterwards. Something might come to mind afterwards that you'd like to follow up on. And we're more than happy to, to take any of your queries afterwards and address them. So thank you very much to everyone. Again, thank you to all our speakers. It was very interesting to hear everybody. And thank you very much, Andrew. And thank you all for, for participating. I hope you found the sessions useful and we do hope that many of you will join us and we look forward to welcoming you onto our beautiful campus here in University of Galway in September. <laughs>